Welcome back to another episode of Wetland Plant Identification. I'm your instructor, Abe. And so far, we've examined a lot of what I would consider more pristine wetland um, types, bogs, fens, some um, high quality uh, fresh marshes and salt marshes. And for my last unit, we're going to explore the antithesis. Most of what you might encounter aren't gonna be the highest quality wetlands, but just kind of wet areas that happen to be in an old field or in a forest edge or something like that. So um, in these types of wetlands, uh, we can encounter all sorts of different species and um, I'm gonna throw in a bunch of uh, those uh, with an emphasis on grasses. And grasses can be one of the more intimidating groups and so I saved it for the last unit since we've had a lot of opportunity up until now to hone our botanical skills. So uh, right now I'm at uh, Padilla Bay National Estuarine Reserve and um, you know, this has a lot of high quality features, but this here just happens to be an old field that has some wet elements and a lot, a big diversity of uh, grasses and a few rushes too. Um, so we're gonna start here and we'll probably explore several different sites in this unit, um, trying to uh, see all the different species that I think are, um, that often show up in these uh, low quality wetland sites. And I'm going to work you through um, a couple different grass keys, starting with a, a very basic one that I think is really great. And then um, we'll also pull out some other grass identification resources like Hitchcock and another grass book that um, just came out recently. So let's get started. Off into the weeds. I'll begin with a quick review of grass anatomy. Um, Barry gave us a nice introduction in the uh, fen unit, but uh, just to review some of that again. Uh, so grasses, uh, sedges have edges, rushes are round, grasses have joints all the way to the ground, or uh, the, the college version is that they have joints that they, uh, the <laughs> grasses have joints when the cops aren't around. Okay, anyway, um, that's the joint there. This one is very swollen and obvious. Uh, moving up the culm, we have some other features. So where the, um, the leaf actually starts on a grass at this joint, and sometimes it'll wrap, or be the, the, they call this the leaf sheath, because it wraps around the culm for um, some of the length of the leaf. And then where the leaf uh, starts to look more like a leaf um, and um, turn away from the culm, we have a structure here that's called a ligule. The ligule will sometimes, this one isn't very well developed, but it'll sometimes stick up um, like a little flange. Um, and then what this one does have that's really nice are these little oracles that, um, that hook around the comb. All right. And then this is just the leaf blade. So moving up the comb, we get to the inflorescence. And this inflorescence is uh, what we'd call a spike because all the spike lits are attached directly to um, the, the center of the comb. Uh, they don't have their own uh, stock, which we would call a um, peduncle. And so each of these are spike lits. And these spike lits happen to be laterally compressed which is a nice feature. Um, and the spike glitz are made up of uh, a series of flowers. Now on grasses, they're very nondescript. They don't have showy petals or anything like that. Um, instead, all those structures have been reduced to uh, two scale-like things called a lima and a palea. And the spike is a collection of those um, lima and paleas with the floral bits in the middle. So we can see here some of the, um, the anthers, which are the parts that release the pollen. They kind of dangle out of the flower normally, out, out of um, the, the uh, lima and the palea that are kind of sandwiched together, um, and will release their pollen. And then the flowers will also have uh, the pistil, the female portion, and um, the stigmatic surface, which usually looks a little more uh, feathery. 
Okay, but getting back to um, a spike, this one I think is the easiest to see, a spikelet. Um, the base of the spikelets have um, two non-fertile structures, and these are called the glooms. So we have the first gloom and the second gloom. So again, these are non-fertile structures, so there's no flowers underneath. These uh, glooms happen to be very long. In some species, they're actually much shorter than the florets that are inside. So the length and shape of the glooms is uh, sometimes a useful feature for different, um, different uh, genera of grasses. And then um, at the tips of either the glooms or the limas or paleas, you can have long pointy structures and those are called um, ons. Okay, so if it looks like it has a hair at the tip of this scale-like structure, um, then that is an on. Okay, so on the, the, the spikelet is composed of the lima and the palea that um, surround a uh, floret or the, the reduced flower that just has um, either the male flower or the female flower or both. And then those are all organized into a spikelet and at the base of that spikelet we have two more scale-like structures that are the, the first gloom and the second gloom, the glooms. So that's the review of most of the terminology we're going to need for um, identifying the grasses. We're going to start off with this um, plants the Pacific Northwest Coast um, because I think it has the most accessible key to the different grass species. Um, so page 356 is where the key starts. And uh, it starts out with couplets like we've done before. So 1A versus 1B. 1A reads inflorescence a spike or spikelets without stalks essentially. Or 1B inflorescence a panicle or raceme spikelets with stalks. So just for comparison we're still working on this species here and um, it is a spike so none of the inflorescences or the um, spikelets have stalks. Um, whereas this grass here, we can see that the spikelets have these long stalks, and this is what we would call um, a panicle, because it's a very branched series of, um, of spikes. Not just one order of branching on the stalks, but two or more orders of branching. All right, but we're going to choose 1A because there are no stalks on these spikelets. Oh, <laughs> and bada bing! <laughs> We just go right to um, Hordium, or the Barley Tribe. Um, so that was an easy start to the key, but um, it goes on. So this is great because we have a, a pictorial key. Um, so in addition to words, they also give us a lot of great pictures. So um, the Hordia, or the Barley Tribe, inflorescence a spike. So under that, um, are the spikelets solitary at each node, or are the spikelets two or three at each node? So um, this here, remember, is the spikelet. And there is just one of these spikelets at each single node. So if I, I, could, if I pull that off, I see that there is a node there where it was attached, and I only get um, one spikelet. So then we go um, to the next branch down, and it says spikelets with flat side facing axis of spike, or spikelets with narrow side facing the axis of the spike. So what does that mean? Um, well, these spikelets are very laterally compressed, and so the flat side is the broad side, and the, the narrow side, you know, it's obviously the narrow side. Um, so the flat side is facing the center of the spike, and that's the axis of the spike. Um, remember, this whole thing is the spike, and this little thing here is the spikelet. So since the broad side is facing the axis of the spike, we take that first branch. 
And um, we're already at a genus, which is great. So that's the agropyrin, or the quack grasses and wheat grasses. Um, we go to page 362 to consult the options. Um, so this, um, this book only has uh, one option, agropyrin repens or um, quack grass. And it so happens that that's what this species is. But um, this book is, you know, has a great introductory key, but it doesn't, it isn't comprehensive. Um, so if I suspected that it wasn't actually agropyrin repens, um, it'd be time for a bigger flora. Um, but I'm satisfied that this is agropyrin repens. So that's our first grass. We fortunately picked an easy one to start with. Here we have Lolium perenni. This is another species that has a strongly laterally compressed spikelet. And in that way, it looks really similar to Agropyrin repens. But instead of that spikelet having the, if this is the spikelet and this is the stem, instead of having that spikelet have the broad side face the stem, the Lolium perenni has the narrow side face the stem. And in that way, it's really distinctive as um, a member of the Lolium genus. Now, um, this species has, uh, this is Lolium perenni, and a couple things uh, are key to distinguishing it from other Loliums. One is that this gloom, it's quite big, but it is shorter than the spikelet. There's another species where the gloom extends um, beyond the spikelet. And also, if you um, take a really close look at the, um, the lemas, they do not have an on, and some of the other species have a lima with an on. Um, the plant is hairless. Um, this kinking at the node is uh, pretty common. Um, and, you know, it'll range in size from less than, from about six inches, probably more so in areas where it gets mowed um, up to a couple feet tall. Sometimes the, um, this part of the spike is called the um, rachis. So this uh, inflorescence is a spike and the stem of the inflorescence uh, between the different um, spikelets is called a rachis. Anyway, the rachis on this um, sometimes is really, really kind of wavy between the different spikelets. So it looks like a snake or something. And it's starting to do that a little bit more up near the top. Lolium perenni. Okay, we got another uh, conspicuous grass here. Right now, I think it's kind of pretty with these um, golden, or they're not golden, they're I don't know, tan tops to them almost white. I think a good practice when you're trying to identify a grass is to um, start by finding a range of uh, maturity. So um, here is one that is just starting to flower. Um, this one, we can actually see some of the, um, the anthers that are releasing the pollen. They're um, actively releasing pollen right now. <laughs> Um, here's one that's probably a little bit past or maybe still flowering, but not so obviously. And then this one is, is done. Okay. So, um, you know, some features are probably still present on this, uh, one that's done, which is what most of, most of these grasses are done flowering. Um, but if it asks about some, uh, traits of the actual florets, or the, the reduced flowers, then we need to see it in flower. So I have all those options here, and um, without them, it might be a little more challenging to go through the key. So let's work our way through the key again. This one will probably be a little more challenging. So uh, backing all the way up to the key to the different tribes. Um, inflorescence, a spike. Spikelets without stalks or inflorescence of panicle or ra raceme, spikelets with stalks. 
So this is the whole inflorescence here, and we can see that it has many branches or stalks in that inflorescence. So it is not a spike, it is a, a panicle. So we choose 1B, and then below 1B it says 2A, each spike with one flower, which is uh, what's called a floret because the flowers are so small, um, glooms small. Or 2B, each spike with two to many flowers or florets. Okay, so um, the glooms in this species are really large. Oh, so that's one indicator that it should not be 2A, that it would be 2B. Um, and they're actually so big that they kind of cover up the uh, florets inside. But I can just go to 2B. Um, okay, so 2B, if we choose 2B, it says to go to 3. So 3A reads, each spikelet with uh, one fertile floret above and one sterile floret below the fertile uh, below the fertile one, spikelets falling off with the glooms attached. Or 3b, each spikelet with two to many florets, sterile florets if present above the fertile ones, except in the Floridae, having two sterile florets below the fertile one. Spikelets usually falling off above the glooms, which would mean that the glooms would persist. Okay, so right now if I dig in, to look inside the glooms, I actually see that um, many of these don't have any any uh, spike um, spikelets in them. So because they fell off and left the glooms, so it must be three um, B. Okay, so that takes us down to. Four below, we got four A says glooms shorter than the first floret, lowest enclosed lima. Um, the lima is on less or on from the tip. So a variable trait there in the lima ons. Or four B glooms equal to or longer than the first floret, um, which means that they're so long that they kind of obscure the florets. And that's definitely the case with this one. Um, the one I peeked into didn't have any florets in it, but um, you know, by and large, oh, there's one that still does. I could see a uh, stamen hanging out. But anyway, the, um, the glooms are totally uh, bigger than the florets, so they're hard to spot. The florets are hard to spot, and the glooms are really obvious. Okay, so that means I choose 5A, which means it's uh, Avenae or the Oat Tribe. The key to the Avenae, or Oat Tribe, is on page 361. Now this is a pictorial key, not a dichotomous key, so instead of just having a couplet with two options, this one presents us with four different options. Now, uh, just quickly looking at the pictures, I can see that they're all fairly, um, they all seem to have fairly prominent ons, except for uh, the one on the right. So let's start with that one. It says uh, perennials. Lower lima onless, upper lima with short hook-like on from just below the smooth tip. And that takes us to Holcus, or the genus that includes the velvet grasses, page 385. And this book only presents us with one option, Holcus lanatus. And that's actually what we have, so um, that's great. It's called um, common velvet grass or Yorkshire fog. So, um, so we got another one. And um, I think some good features of the holcus are, well, it's called velvet grass for a reason. The, um, the leaf sheaths are really um, soft, hairy. And this is a great trait because you can actually identify this grass um, before it's flowering or after the flowers are gone um, by this very densely um, felted, soft, hairy um, leaf sheath. Now this is a very weedy species and common to see um, in both wetter sites and also um, non-wetter sites. Oh, another weedy grass. Let's work on this one next. 
So let's start at the top of the key here again. 1A, inflorescence of spike, spikelets without stalks, or 1B, inflorescence of panicle or raceme, spikelets with stalks. So this looks at first to be a spike, but if I look very closely, I could see that um, actually the spikelets have their own little um, stalks. They're not directly attached to the, to the inflorescence. So that makes it a raceme. Okay, so we, that could have been tricky, but looking closely, we can see that we have a raceme. So we go, um, that means we take 1B, go to 2, 2A says each spike with one flower or floret glooms small, or 2B each spike with two to many flowers. Once again, I found a range of ages here. So this one is still flowering, this one is kind of mature, and this one is um, mostly done, probably gone to seed. So one of these spikes, spikelets, Great, because the, both the pistils and the stamens are so obvious here. One, two, well, there's more than, there's more than um, one flower. We'll probably have to count those later. Looks like there might have been three. Okay, so we take 2B, says to go to 3. 3A says, each spikelet with one fertile floret above and one sterile floret below the fertile one, uh, below the fertile one. Spikelets falling off with the glooms attached. Or each spikelet with two to many florets. Sterile florets are present above the fertile ones. And there are um, two to many florets that are um, fertile. So we can take 3B. Um, it says go to 4. 4A says gloom shorter than the first floret. Um, lemas onless or on from the tip. Or 4B glooms equal to or longer than the first floret. Okay, so these glooms are pretty long and they're actually obscuring a lot of the floral characters. It's only the, um, the actual stigmatic surfaces and the um, the anthers that are uh, poking out enough to see. So we can say that the glooms are longer than the florets. So we're down to five. 5A five reads glooms narrow, lemas on from the back or onless, sterile florets if present above the fertile florets. Or 5B glooms broad, boat shaped, lemas on from a notch tip or onless spikeless spikelets with one fertile floret above two sterile floret. Okay, so are the essentially are the ons boat shaped um, and if is the sterile floret above or below the fertile floret. We are really gonna have to dig into this. I could see that there's obviously a fertile floret because it has stigmas poking out. Well, it appears to be, I'd say, a little bit boat-shaped. We're getting into tricky territory in the field. This is probably better microscope territory, or macroscope territory. Well, it looks to me like the um, fertile floret is above the sterile florets. So let's see where that takes us. There's a 357. Um, that would be 5B or the Phalaridae, the canary grass tribe. Okay, so the Phalaridae has three different genera presented in this book. I'm sure there are more. Um, spikelets, three flowered, glooms broad, and boat shaped. Um, so we have a uh, panicle open, lemas onless or ond is the Heracloa which we saw in um, the Fen unit, uh, Barry keyed that one out. Um, or 
and it's obviously not that the um, the glooms are more narrow than the Heracloa. Uh, panicle spike-like, sterile. Oh, panicle spike-like. I remember that the panicle is very spike-like. Sterile lemas on, anthoxanthum, or panicle compact, spikelets all crowded, all turned in the same direction. Um, lemas onless. Okay, well, um, it's the anthoxanthum. This is anthoxanthum odoratum, which I have a fun time saying. Friends of mine and I, we all declare anthoxanthum odoratum. <laughs> all right. Uh, so this is sometimes called sweet vernal grass, um, and it has kind of a stinky aroma. It's in the same uh, group as sweet grass, the, the plant that people um, like to smell. <laughs> uh, and, you know, when you're walking through a field, you can kind of get the odor of the sweet grass if, there's, if it's present. So uh, I think just the, the spike-like nature of the florets are pretty distinctive. Um, and once you're familiar with this, you'll, you can recognize it at a glance. It's one of the more common grasses in the peepit lowlands, even though it's not native. Um, so anthoxanthum odoratum, or sweet vernal grass. Vernal means spring, so this is one that um, often will flower earlier in the spring. Uh, look at this nice expanse of reddish grass, red-topped grass. Um, we'll do this one next. And this has very, very fine florets. The whole inflorescence is almost impossible to see, it probably is on camera. Um, here I picked a range in sizes, so this one is not yet open. Um, the others are spreading. Inflorescence, a spike. Um, no, it looks like the inflorescence is a panicle or a raceme. This is actually a raceme. Okay, so that's 1B, takes us to 2. Each spike with one flower, um, gloom small, or each spike with two to many flowers. Um, and these indeed are small, but let's see if I could get a better look at it with a hand lens. The glooms are very small and um, just has one flower. So that um, takes us to the uh, Agrostidae, the bent grass tribe. Here we are, Agrostidae. Spikelets one flowered. That's the key for that tribe. Inflorescence spike-like or inflorescence not spike-like. So this has a panicle, not spike-like. So we go down this branch um, says panicle not drooping or panicle drooping. This panicle is very um, upright, not drooping. Okay, so does the do the lemas, are they tufted? Lemas with tuft of stiff hairs at the base, or lemas lacking tuft of hairs at the base. Again, that's going to be a feature for the hand lens. Um, let me try and find one that's a little more open. There it is. Looks like the spikes have, the florets have fallen out of the more mature glooms. And there are no tufts of hairs in the lemas. So that takes us to Agrostis, a genus that is pretty diverse. Um, they're commonly called the bent grasses. I guess the whole tribe is called the bent grass tribe, but the um, Agrostis genus is also called the bent grass genus. And this is uh, far from a diagnostic feature, but um, they're called, one reason they're called bent grasses is at the nodes, they tend to kink. That's true of a lot of grasses, I know, so don't 
assume that it's a bent grass just because it kinks. They also should have this open, upright um, panicle and uh, spikelets with just one floret. Now, uh, bent grasses um, are very diverse and challenging. Um, this bent grass appears to be um, rhizomatous. We don't see, um, it's not a cespitose grass. And one bent grass to rule out right away is if you pull up a bunch and look for, uh, look to see if they're rooting at the nodes or developing new stems at the nodes. Um, that could tell you if it's Agrostis stoliniferus, which is one of our common Agrostis species. So this one actually is um, developing a new stem right at that node where the node was touching the ground. Um, so this is indeed um, Agrostis stoliniferus. So the Agrostis, the, the key feature is that they just have one floret um, per spikelet. And, and they, um, the spikelets are always very, very small. So Agrostis is pretty recognizable from a distance, even though it's hard to uh, recognize up close um, uh, by species. But as a group, they often form these expansive uh, colonies. Many of them have um, a red or purple hue to um, all the, the, to the glooms. And um, even though they're not a very tall species, they are very um, rhizominous and they could um, expand across big patches of field. Sometimes you get a few sedges in these old field settings and the most likely one, um, at least the one that looks like this is uh, Carex pachystachia. So this has a fairly congested inflorescence. We see that it has several spikes that are all um, small and sessile and crowded right up at the tip. And there's usually a bract that's fairly long coming off the base of that inflorescence. And uh, these will get to be kind of a brown colored in the summer, but they start off a little bit more green and brown. It's a cespitose species, um, but can be pretty common once you tune your eyes to it, it'll show up frequently in these old fields. So this is in a group that's a uh, fairly challenging, um, called the ovales section of the sedges. And they all have perigenia that um, are fairly broad, they're flat, lenticular um, perigenia and achenes inside them and they tend to have a pretty uh, big wing around the edge of the um, actual achene. So the section is ovales, or ovaries maybe. I don't really know how to say it. It's one of those words you just read all the time and you never actually say. Carex pachystachia. Beside me here is a really weedy species of grass called Dactylus glomerata. Now, uh, the common name is orchard grass was introduced into this area, maybe to plant in orchards, I'm not really sure. But it's a pretty robust species, uh, can get to be about four feet tall. And I think it's one that is easy to recognize from a distance um, because it tends to have these fairly spreading panicles that have um, tightly clumped, or it's not even a word, but they're kind of like glom, glom, globs. <laughs> it's like glomerata, they're like globs of, um, of uh, spikelets all clustered at the tips of these um, fairly long stalks. Now in the spring they will kind of compress together um, and look more like just a, a, a single spike. But um, when they spread you could really see how they um, are round on one side and kind of angular where they used to be squished up against each other. So they look like a uh, spheres that have been squished on um, three sides or something. Some finer features, uh, this has a hairless comb and leaves, and it has pretty distinct ligules. We could see this one, the ligule is still totally intact, but sometimes the ligules get really frayed, like this one here. If you rub the stem up, you'll get a little bit of 
Um, it's a little bit catchy. Almost wants to, almost like sandpaper. So that's the orchard grass or the Dactyla squamorata. There are a few grasses that get as tall as reed canary grass. This one is probably seven feet tall and um, it forms, it's a rhizominous species so it can just form these giant colonies um, and very little can compete with it. And um, this is, has both native and um, introduced uh, varieties, but most of the ones in Western Washington are thought to be um, a non-native variety that was introduced actually as a um, erosion control species and as a um, hay species for um, cattle. Identifying features of this um, has these uh, spikes or an inflorescence that is spike-like. Um, it looks like a spike when it's um, all tightly packed like this, but you can see that over time they'll spread um, and, and look more like a panicle. This one even more so. Um, and then the ligule is often there is also a very good feature. So it has this very um, large ligule and um, the sheath uh, makes kind of a deep V. The leaves are very large, um, you know, probably three quarters of an inch broad. Um, and it has a very leafy comb. So all the way up and down we can see that these leaves um, are very prominent. This species um, just generates a huge amount of biomass because it gets so tall and then it'll lay flat later in the year um, and kind of smother out any other species that might be in this area. So this is the reed canary grass or Phalaris arundinaceus and um, it's about the most robust species of grass that um, we have. There's another introduced species called um, giant reed grass, Phragmites, and um, we don't really see that as much uh, in more upland environments, but when you get into pretty wet areas, um, that uh, Phragmites can show up. I uh, don't think I'm gonna be able to show it to you during this course, but if, if you're in a salt marsh, the upper end of a salt marsh, that's a good species to look for and you see this giant grass it can get to be eight or nine feet tall um, the flowers are a little more plumose than the um, reed canary grass but look for that one last note um, it can extend kind of rhizomatously as these stems lay down onto the ground um, they could root and we could see that um, it's starting to grow anew uh, both here and there um, starting to grow little offshoots on the stem. All right, we got another grass here. This one is fairly tall. Um, and there are two options for this species. Um, it's either Shedonorus uh, arundinaceus or Shedonorus pretensis. So both species can have pretty wide uh, blades on their leaves and they tend to have mostly basal leaves, not too many leaves on the culms. But um, to distinguish them, we need to find a culm that does have leaves on it. And remember, if we pull the leaf away from the culm, we expose the ligule and the oracle. Now, on um, Shedonorus arundinaceus, the oracle, that little thing that wraps around the edge of the, or the comb, um, it should have ciliate hairs on the oracle. The ligule is actually very small in this species, about a millimeter. And uh, unfortunately, those ciliate hairs will wear off with time. <laughs> but evidently just a few hairs is all that's needed to um, identify the species. And I do see some ciliate hairs. So that's one good hint that it's um, actually Shedonorus arundinaceus. And then another feature is on the, um, on the spikelets. On Shedonorus arundinaceus, the lemas have ons, whereas on Shedonorus pretense, the lemas 
um, do not have ons. And <laughs> this one, um, the ons are pretty short, but I am seeing short ons. So this is um, Shedonorus arundinaceus. I want to plug another book here. This is The Field Guide to Grasses of Oregon, Washington, produced by the Character Working Group, the same folks that produced The Field Guide to the Sedges of Washington and Oregon. And um, I like this because it's more com much more comprehensive than POJAR. Um, of course, the keys in it are going to be a little more challenging because there are more options to choose from. But um, I just want to flip to the page of the the two pages for the Shed Norris. We have Shed Norris arendinaceus. Uh, we can see they have nice photos of the ciliate hairs on the oracles. We can see the ons on the lemas um, as opposed to the Shed Norris pretense, um, the lack of the ons on the lemas and the lack of the hairs on the oracles. And another difference between the two is that um, Shedonorus pretense usually is more of a rhizomatous species, whereas um, this strongly clumped nature of, um, you know, all these leaves are coming out at one point, strongly cespitose nature is um, fairly common in the Shedonorus arundinaceus. It will occasionally be a little bit rhizomatous, but I most often see it in this, um, in these clumps. Very tall species. I think the the one that I'm most likely to think of when I see it from a distance um, is uh, reed canary grass, Polaris arendinacea. But um, when you get closer, there are so many differences. It has um, a comb that doesn't have a lot of leaves on it. Um, it is usually clumped, whereas Polaris is uh, strongly rhizominous. And then when you look at the spikes, they are um, they're very different. They have um, kind of slightly flattened um, uh, spikelets with many um, florets in each spikelet. Okay, an herbaceous plant, something not grassy. Uh, this is called curly dock or Rumix crispus in the Polygonaceae or the dock family. Um, and this species, uh, you know, let's see, we covered the western dock in the salt marsh unit, this is more of a weedy species that grows in old fields. Um, and uh, uh, I think the best feature for distinguishing it from the western dock is that the leaves are very narrow and it's called Rumix crispus because the margins are wavy. I think in Latin crispus means wavy or something. Um, now this species has um, those same like three-sided seed head things, but they, these are a lot smaller than on the western dock, the Rumix occidentalis. Here we have another species of dock that's common in weedy areas um, with a little bit of moisture, but it doesn't have to have it. This is called Rumix obtusifolius, or broadleaf dock. Obtusifolius just literally means broadleaf. And um, so the size of the leaf is a good way to distinguish it from the other dock uh, that we saw today, uh, the Rumix crispus. Um, another good way to distinguish it is looking at these seeds. So the, the seeds are enclosed in what are called uh, tepals. Um, and the margins of those tepals are, um, uh, have these little hair-like points on the outsides. Um, Whereas here I brought one of the Rumix crispus um, inflorescences and the margins of those tepals are smooth. Now you might recall that we saw another dock, the Rumix occidentalis in the uh, estuarine salt marsh unit. And um, Rumix occidentalis also has those smooth margin tepals that surround the seeds, um, but they're much bigger and uh, probably two or three times bigger than um, on either of these two species. Now there are quite a few other species, uh, but just um, get used to cluing in to the, the tepal features because that's uh, a really good way of distinguishing 
things like Rumix conglomeratus, which you might come across, um, or uh, Solicifolius. Um, anyway, there are quite a few other Rumix species. But I think Rumix obtusifolius and Rumix, cr Rumix crispus are the most common um, in these kind of weedy fields. On our walk back, we came across another Rumix, so I thought I'd throw it in the mix. This is Rumix conglomeratus. I mentioned it earlier as being another one that's good to know. And um, some kind of gestalt distance features is that it tends to have this highly branched inflorescence that looks almost shrub-like. Um, and the, uh, the flowers are pretty clumped in these um, whorls, axial whorls, um, all the way up to the tip. And the leaves, uh, the stem leaves look really linear like Rumix crispus, but as you get down um, lower, the leaves get broader um, and start to look a little bit like Rumix obtusa folia. So the leaves aren't really a great feature. Um, but when you zoom in and really look at these, um, these seed capsules, um, the, the tepals clasp that seed, a sheen, really, really tightly and they look almost like uh, a little duck head or something like that. Um, and th the tepal is really small relative to the seed. We sometimes get ferns that show up in wetlands. Um, this is bracken fern, Teridium aquilinum. And I see this fern in bogs sometimes. I see it in wet meadows. Uh, it also grows in very dry um, prairie environments, uh, very versatile fern. Um, now, I think the one that this might most get confused with is um, like lady fern or wood fern, um, but the big difference is that it comes out of the ground individually. So here we can see that this stem is just coming out of the ground by itself. There's actually an underground rhizome that probably connects this shoot to this shoot and to this shoot. And then maybe there's another one back here that connects this shoot to this shoot. Um, and so they come out of the ground individually. They usually grow fairly um, straight up or maybe um, slightly leaning to the side at the top. And they don't have too many branches. Um, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, eight major branches with a few small ones at the tip is maybe common, whereas the lady fern is gonna just have a lot of um, what looks more like one frond. This almost looks, because these branches are so robust, it kind of looks like it has um, eight fronds on one stem. But the whole thing is one frond or one leaf that is um, uh, once, twice, thrice, the three to four times pinnate. It's highly pinnate. Um, now in the spring, these um, kind of unfurl a little bit like uh, the, the classic fiddlehead shape. There's one over here that is still in the process of doing that. And when, they're, when they are unfurling, they're pretty, the, the stems are coated with this, um, these fine hairs. You can see that I'm rubbing them off. Um, but they don't curl up and form a, a fiddlehead as much as others. They, they look a little bit more like a, a fist that is kind of un um, opening. Uh, here's one down here that's still curled. It doesn't have any of the branches yet. So that's the bracken fern. Um, you know, it's actually a, an edible um, species. Um, and in this part of the world, not so much the fiddlehead was the edible part, but um, the uh, roots are traditionally eaten and they, they have these long black rhizomes that are often associated in, um, in stories with uh, snakes, maybe because sma snakes like hanging out under bracken ferns, or maybe because the rhizomes themselves look like snakes. Um, but anyway, the rhizomes are traditionally roasted on coals and pounded, and you could get this um, starchy flower that comes out from between the black fibers inside the rhizome, and it's made into a, a bread that's baked on hot coals and eaten. I experiment a little bit with it, but haven't had too much success myself. <laughs> so sometimes these bracken ferns can get to be really tall. This one here is probably the, 
one of the tallest I've ever seen in my life. It's got to be over eight or maybe nine feet tall. Um, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> Another interesting note about the rhizomes um, being edible is that um, the Nooksack tribe from um, Western Washington here, um, they actually take their name from the name from their name for this plant. Um, so they call this plant Saak, specifically the rhizome, and uh, kind of south uh, east of Linden, there's a place that they call Nooksaak, which means always bracken fern rhizome harvesting place <laughs> or something like that. And um, over a long period of time, uh, the people just became known, the people that lived there became known as the Nooksaak people um, after the place name where there was always um, good bracken fern rhizomes to harvest. So it must have been a really important food plant um, to have a, a place named after the food plant. Grasses and sedges aren't the only things that can either be cespitose or um, expand clonally by rhizomes or runners. Uh, we have buttercups that employ that variety of uh, life history strategies too. Um, and uh, two weedy buttercups that kind of tolerate wetlands pretty well and um, you often see in old degraded fields uh, are the tall buttercup and the creeping buttercup. So this is tall buttercup, ranunculus acris, right here. <clears throat> so it grows in a clump and it'll send one to many flowering stems, um, usually straight up into the air. Now, the buttercups have really yellow flowers, usually with um, five petals. Um, the sepals actually are kind of a white, white to yellow as well. And um, a couple interesting things about the buttercups is that the, um, the petals at the base often have these nectaries. So a nectary is just a structure that releases extra nectar to a, a attract insects for pollination. So it's just, in this case, it's a little pouch that's right at the base of the petal. Buttercups have multiple um, pistils per flower, and one way that you could um, see that easily is that when they go to seed, each flower will actually produce um, many, many seeds because each of those pistils, if it's fertilized, will turn into a seed. Now, in buttercups, we call those seeds achenes, um, just as in sedges, we call the seeds achenes. And on this ranunculus acris, um, they're a little bit hooked at the tip, the achenes are. Um, a good, besides the upright stature or habit of the um, ranunculus acris, another good feature is that the leaves are palmately divided. So you might think of them a little bit like a maple leaf, except the lobes go even deeper than a maple leaf would. And they all kind of point towards one point. All the lobes point towards one central point. Let's see if I could find a bigger leaf that, yeah, here's a bigger leaf. We could see those palmate lobes. Now, as you move towards the, the terminal, or the, uh, the leaves that are part of the inflorescence, um, they are more reduced. Um, here, these might be described as bracts, um, just with three little um, lobes. And I guess this is divided into three lobes as well, but each of the lobes is further divided. Okay, so this is Ranunculus acris, another um, buttercup that is uh, common uh, and actually it's growing all around it here, is Ranunculus repens, or creeping buttercup. The creeping buttercup does just that. It um, really, if I, um, if we look down into the, down along the ground here, we can see all these runners. And they, like strawberry runners, they um, root nodally. Um, and that's why it's called creeping. Here's one I can pull the root out. It's 
So this is the stolen, and those are the adventitious roots. Um, the creeping buttercup leaves are more obviously trifoliate, and they often have these watermarks on them. This one also has some dead marks, but we could see these little white patches. So there are three leaflets. This one is further divided into um, three lobes. And, oh, here's the flower. Um, the flowers are similarly yellow. I think they're, uh, well, they're much shorter in stature, closer to the ground. Um, and the petals tend to be a little bit bigger than the... Um, Meadow buttercup, Ranunculus acris. But the best features for distinguishing the two are the leaves, um, because these are so obviously uh, trifoliate um, and they're not so deeply lobed, whereas um, the uh, Ranunculus acris is a little less obviously trifoliate and the lobes are more uh, divided. We have some native buttercups too, but um, there, many of them are either more like prairie buttercups or um, or obligate wetland buttercups like Ranunculus flamula or Ranunculus aquatilis, and um, I think I covered a few of those in the uh, in other units. Here we have uh, Prunella vulgaris or self heal. This um, purple uh, terminal flower cluster is, or spike of flowers, is um, a good feature. Now, um, this plant is in the uh, mint family, the Lamiaceae. It has the classic square stem of mints and opposite leaves. And um, we can see that it produces these axial flowering shoots, which a lot of mints will do. Um, but the flowers themselves aren't axial, they're terminal on these axial flowering shoots. And then um, sometimes, especially when the plants are small, like in a mowed field, you'll only see the terminal flower. But when they're in areas that aren't mowed and they, they get taller, um, then they'll produce these uh, lateral flowering shoots. Um, now this plant is called heal all because it is used um, as a medicine um, but I can't remember what it's used for. <laughs> anyway, it's used uh, all over the world as a medicine. And we have both native and introduced varieties of this heal all. I see it sometimes in wetlands, like it was up at the Daily Prairie um, and other places, uh, it makes its way up into the mountains even. Um, so a couple different varieties and uh, native and introduced um, uh, strains as well. Uh, a marsh plant that will sometimes show up in old fields is the cattail, and we have two different types of cattails. Um, Typha latifolia, the broadleaf cattail, which is native, and Typha angustifolia, the narrowleaf cattail, which is non-native. And there's more to telling them apart than just the thickness of their leaves. But first let me talk about the broadleaf cattail. So um, I actually have a little spectrum here of the cattails in various stages of maturity. So this one here, uh, these, this is a spike of uh, the female flowers, not very fat yet, and then the uh, male flowers, which will release the pollen, uh, is on top, and um, they're very green. Um, this one here is just starting to, uh, it's already done pollinating, the male flowers have released their pollen, the female flowers have been pollinated and now they're starting to turn brown. Um, oops, and we could see that here they're fully brown and this is last year's head and these are just seeds that are left over. They never got blown off, but obviously they are dispersed by the wind. So the key feature for identifying the um, broadleaf cattail, the most reliable feature I think, is by looking at um, this interface between the spike of male flowers and the female flowers. So there's um, they're continuous, there's no gap. The narrowleaf cattail, can, um, 
Typha angustifolia, it'll kind of look like like this. There's a a bare patch between the um, the male spike and the female spike. Um, it's just some interesting tidbits. Every part of this plant is edible. You can um, yank the uh, the foliage out of the ground in the spring and strip off the green leaves and you'll be left with a white stem and eat that and it's um, you know it's not delicious but it's um, not bad tasting either and it's pretty filling if you were starving in the woods this plant could uh, would be a good one to find um, or starving in a marsh rather the rhizomes are really um, starchy and take a little bit of processing but they have a dense core in the middle of the starchy rhizome or the spongy rhizome, the dense core is filled with starch and is very edible. And um, the these spikes um, in this stage, when, uh, before they turn brown, um, when they're green still, you could uh, boil them and kind of eat them like a cob of corn, gnaw off that, um, the green flesh. Or you could collect the pollen out of the male spike when they're just releasing their pollen. Now, this is kind of odd that it still um, has um, a male spike that hasn't released its pollen this late in the summer. Usually they um, release their pollen around the first day of the summer, at least in uh, Whatcom County. Cattails have these narrow leaves that are um, fairly spongy because they have that uh, arenchymous tissue inside of them. Um, and they're a really popular weaving material. The Coast Salish um, like to make mats out of them. I think of them as like nature's thermorest because they're uh, so spongy. But even though the leaves are flat, the stem, if we look at it in cross section, is uh, pretty round. And that's actually a good way to distinguish it from another look-alike species that's actually growing right next to it. Let me slice the stem of this one. And we could see that this one here has a very uh, much more flattened um, stem and cross section. And this here doesn't usually get as tall. And it has a yellow flower and these uh, banana pod like uh, seed clusters. Um, this is the yellow flag iris and non native species that commonly grows right at the edge of, um, of marshes. Um, and it can be a pretty problematic invasive species. So, Iris pseudocorus. And here we have the Typha latifolia. Here's a conspicuous species when it's blooming, and these yellow flowers really pop um, in weedy areas, and sometimes in uh, native or uh, wetlands that are dominated by native species, um, this will show up. This is uh, lotus uliginosus, or um, or a type of uh, trefoil. Now, uh, there's a really closely related species called bird's foot trefoil that I think a lot of people misidentify this as, um, lotus uh, corniculatus. Both species are found in western Washington. They both can show up in um, our wet uh, wetland edges. Anyway, this is in the pea family. So it has those irregular flowers with, um, you know, with a banner up on top and a keel on the bottom uh, with just one line of symmetry. Um, the flowers are all in, a, all in a kind of a head, a cluster. Another good feature for the lotus genus in the Fabaceae or the pea family is um, that the, instead of a lot of the clovers that have three leaflets, this genus has five leaflets. So it has two leaflets that are right at the base of the petiole, and then it has three leaflets that are at the end of the petiole. A shared feature with the bird's foot trefoil, um, when those yellow flowers are um, you know, pollinated, they'll turn into these um, spreading seed heads. And it's called bird's foot trefoil because um, they look like a bird's feet, they spread um, out the way that a chicken foot, the toes on a chicken foot kind of spreads out. Now let's talk about how to distinguish this from the uh, Lotus corniculatus. So I think some of the best features for distinguishing it um, are on the 
um, the young flower heads. Because the petals haven't emerged yet, we can see the calyx lobes. And on Lotus corniculatus, the calyx lobes are incurved. But on Lotus uliginosus, the calyx lobes are recurved like my thumb. I can't make my fingers do that because I'm not double jointed. Um, and then another easy feature is just uh, pick the stem and um, look very closely at the stem. If it's hollow in the middle, then it's Lotus uliginosus. If it's solid in the middle, it's Lotus corniculatus. Lotus uliginosus also tends to be a little bit more uh, rhizomatous, um, so it'll, it'll form a, a denser patch, whereas Lotus corniculatus is um, more single plants. All right, beside me here is Scirpus microcarpus. This was actually the first sedge that I ever learned as a recently inspired uh, botany nerd wannabe uh, at Camp Black Mountain in the Boy Scouts. Um, and uh, it's called, commonly called small fruited bulrush like a lot of the other bulrushes. Um, it has a stem that isn't uh, as triangular as say a lot of the uh, Carex genus sedges. Um, this has um, a stem that is triangular, but the edges of the triangle are kind of rounded, especially when it's in fruit like it is now. Um, it's called, yeah, Scirpus microcarpus. Micro means small, carpus means seed, and um, the, the seeds inside of these seed heads are, are quite small. Uh, the seed heads themselves are highly um, congested on um, on stalks that sort of vary in size. <clears throat> some are long, some are short. Usually it has uh, several bracts that subtend the whole infl inflorescence, uh, that, and these are fairly large leafy bracts. Now as it ages, these tend to uh, reflex a bit, but when they're younger, you might see them poking out at funny angles. Um, <clears throat> and a, a good feature is the breadth of the leaves. These leaves are really, really wide, uh, wider than any other bulrush that I know. And um, a lot of the sedges have um, kind of V-shaped leaves in cross-section. Um, these are more than just a V. I guess if you look at it from this side, it looks like an M, but usually books describe it as being uh, W-shaped in cross-section. Um, and they're sort of sharp on the edges. You wouldn't want to sprint through a patch of Scirpus microcarpus. Um, so there we have it. A bulrush that grows uh, in the edges of, on the edges of marshes, uh, sometimes old fields. Um, I'll, I'll see it in swamps even, under um, alders especially. Um, but usually it wants to be in soils that are um, in real wetland sites. Um, they, they might not be saturated all year round. They're probably not saturated all year round, but they certainly are wetland hydric soils. Beside me here is a plant that I know is in the Fabaceae, or the pea family. Uh, it's in fruit right now, and there, um, this pod here is filled with little peas. The Fabaceae has these pea pods. And um, Fabaceae often has um, compound leaves, usually pinnately compound, and then the, um, the flower that just has one line of symmetry with a banner on the top and kind of a keel on the bottom. Um, but Fabaceae is a huge family, and so we, wa we want to dig into that a little more. So. One, um, one thing to look at right away is the um, compound leaf. Is it uh, even pinnate or odd pinnate? Well, this one has two, four, six, eight, ten leaflets on it. And instead of having one terminal leaflet, which would make it odd pinnate, it has um, a tendril. So here we see the two, four, six, eight, ten. Um, it has this little tendril on the end instead of a terminal leaflet. Of the odd pinnate possibilities, we just have two genera. Uh, well, three, but two that are common. One is a cultivated plant. We have Vicia, or um, Vicia and Lathrus. 
Okay, so we've actually seen Lathrus uh, palustris in the salt marsh unit. Um, and to distinguish the Vicia from the Lathrus, we have to uh, get inside the flower. Okay, so here's a flower. And um, if I pull this keel part down from the banner, um, I can get in and see the, uh, the stamen. Sorry. <laughs> I can see the pistil, the female part of the, fl of the flower. Now, this pistil looks like a little bottle brush on top. It has um, stigmatic surfaces um, all the way around it, right at the tip. Uh, and so that tells me that this is Vicia. Lathrus looks like a toothbrush. All the stigmatic surfaces are just concentrated on one side of it instead of being all the way around it. Um, so that takes us to Vicia, and then some features of Vicia sativa, which this species is, include. Um, the flowers are subsessile, which means they are almost sessile. They just have a little teeny um, stalk on the base of the flowers. Um, and that's it. That's the, uh, that's the, the only option with the subsessile flowers, the odd pinnate leaves and the um, bottle brush um, pistol or stigmatic surface. Very common um, field species. Uh, so if you're doing a wetland delineation in an old field where mo most wetland delineations are, uh, it's a good possibility you'll see this plant. This is Timothy grass or Phleum pretense. And uh, this grass has this um, cylindrical looking panicle uh, it looks like a spike, but if you get right into it, you'll see that it's a panicle. And um, some distinctive features, uh, it tends to be fairly long. And um, when you look at the glooms, um, they, they, they look uh, like forks. They have two points at the tip of each of the glooms. Um, other features, uh, the ligule is kind of pointy on the tip. And the sheath is fairly loose, but this is an easy one to recognize from a distance by that uh, very cylindrical looking uh, inflorescence. And, um, and then when you look close and see those uh, glooms, then you'll know for sure. Evidently, cattle really like uh, foraging on the phleum, and it was introduced po possibly as one of the first um, deliberately introduced grasses in this area for hay. So very common in fields for that reason because it's planted as a hay crop. There's another species of grass in here that looks uh, from a distance a lot like the phleum pretense. Um, but let's take a closer look. Um, one thing I notice right away is that it's really dry, whereas the phleum is uh, still flowering, very um, fresh looking, green looking. Uh, these are so far along that the, they're just disintegrating um, in the wind or when I abuse them, touch them. Um, this is actually called Alipicurus pretensis or meadow foxtail. And uh, some good features, it doesn't have that um, forked gloom like the phleum. It, um, the, the gloom actually is very hairy along the edges. If we look at these glooms, the margins are uh, very coarsely haired and you could actually see on some of them how the um, the lemas have an on and that on sticks out and is kind of at a, a kinked at an angle. Alipicurus pretensis flowers in the late winter or early spring so by midsummer it's usually very um, dried out which we see here. From a distance dry midsummer um, cylindrical spike. Is it, is it Timothy or is it meadow foxtail? Well, if it's dry in the midsummer, it's probably the, the meadow foxtail, the Alipicurus. Alipicurus pretensis grows commonly in a meadow environment. And if you see uh, one that's growing out of water or water soils, uh, you should suspect Alipicurus um, geniculatus.
those are all the species that we're going to cover today and this is the last unit so i just wanted to take this opportunity to thank you all for enrolling in this class and let you know that i enjoy uh, interacting with my students typically that's why i teach and you know in this online learning environment um, i don't really get to see folks much so if you happen to see me walking along the street or on campus and you want to let me know that you took my class that would be great or if you live further away and you have an unknown species uh, don't hesitate to send a photo to me i, I sort of enjoy um, sleuthing mystery plants um, so thanks again and um, hope you hope this uh, class helped you improve your botany skills or improve your credentials as a wetland scientist or um, inspire you to learn more about plants take care